There is a very good question whether or not Crash is a character that after the nostalgia of doing the games we've already made, do you take the character and do something new, do something more contemporary that speaks to this generation of gamer? And I don't know. I don't know if you go back and take a character from PlayStation and can make them relevant beyond the nostalgia. So that remains to be seen. I don't, I don't know, know if you go back and take a character from PlayStation and can make them relevant beyond the nostalgia. So that remains to be seen. I don't know if you go back and take a character from PlayStation and can make them relevant beyond the nostalgia. So that remains to be seen. The ancients would not allow it. Crash Bandicoot makes my Oh, it cannot be. Can't you idiots do anything right? Not proper. Chips and beans. Eat less. Let's have all. Well, the past few years have kind of been slow. Wrath of Cortex didn't do as well as we'd hoped, and... <laughs> Fish? Is there no dumb cops among you? Let's have the challenge. Where's the admin when you need him? An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. Are you getting it? You were a skank! Let's just do it! My name sounds like fetus. Finish! Where the video game? Oh, it's good to be back! Where the video game? Oh, golly! Go get him! Outer fish. I fall. I can't breathe! <laughs> Will he ever come back? John Layden. Ooh. What's going on? You don't even know the half of it, mate. Crash is here. We're just awesome. Don't miss. Suck. I want to live in this century. Bye, bro. What up, baby? Mm -hmm. Uh oh. <laughs> oh, you're cool. All right, here we go. Smash Brandy's cooch. Crash for Epson Chat. Funny. Seemed like more. Oh, this ain't easy. Crash 4 has proven incredibly difficult to talk about. I'm not sure it even exists, not because I didn't think it would ever happen, I just didn't expect it to happen like this. So surreal. See, I worry if I say it's good or bad or give this a big clickbait title, we're not going to properly process or best represent the points I want to get across. Still, it's only fair that you're probably wondering what my overall impression must be. So, is this my new favourite Crash game? Well, no. But it's up there, baby. I've been watching the conversation around this very carefully, and I think people are talking about all the right things, whether they be positive or negative. But what I want to impress over everything else is why those conversations are happening. What makes this one so unique? I have never, hands down, never played a revival game that's been this eye-opening. Not only managing to recapture the feeling of the past, but telling me why I like this series in ways I've never thought about, good and bad. I responded very strongly to what it was doing, and in the end, I felt Crash 4 was the most fascinating case study for the franchise yet. Outside of that one with the unbeatable anime boss? <laughs> yeah, uh, dragging that one out for a final bow. It's a genuinely transformative moment, one that dozens of other attempts couldn't seem to crack, and I want to break down why that is, get my hands in the mucky muck and... <laughs> sure, I I'll explain the things I like and don't, but what I hope you take away is Crash 4's value as a proper sequel, why it will remain so interesting even after this series continues. As long as they keep these people around for a while, then it's all fine by me. I could not be happier with their approach. We'll laugh, we'll cry, we'll know the reasons why, and maybe along the way we'll discover if we really, truly, actually, for realsies, saved video games.
I know this guy thinks so. Crush Bandicoot? Now, to tell you that story, I have to tell you this one. <laughs> Naughty Dog's Crash was a tough act to follow, three games that defined the original PlayStation's era and served as the alternative to Nintendo's Plumber Boy, but edgier, tighter, naughty. They made what looked like a living cartoon on limited technology, which, coupled with an extremely focused and addictive set of mechanics, transformed these trim little titles into endlessly replayable experiences. When Jason let the dogs out to work on new franchises for Sony, the rights moved over to their collaborators who thought, sure, the public wants sequels, let's make sequels. And that's where things got a little, uh, to use a professional development term often used in industry circles by experts, sus. Crash sequels post Naughty Dog were a tough business, often made by teams who were under budget or inexperienced or misguided or all three. And while the reported story has always been, those games suck, return to Naughty, I'm in way too deep with this franchise to possibly agree. There's too many moments where you can see the effort people put in or the good ideas worth keeping hold of. Being realistic though, I have to accept I'm in deeper than most. I love the world of Crash and was a committed fan. Of course, fans were going to invest in every new title. Many casual players couldn't make it past what were essentially average games, and when they started messing with the look to appeal to, gosh, I'm still not sure, the knee-jerk reaction wasn't in its favour. So, Activision axed the franchise, waited a decade, then checked to see if the public were still interested by remaking the beloved originals, and the further we get away from that game's release, the less happy I am with its lasting effect. Vicarious Vision's Insane Trilogy did the job. It was a way for Activision, who couldn't print those original games again, to claim full ownership, but was mostly good because the games it matched are, well, good. It was less than consistent in the solidity of its controls and already looks horribly dated. No real attempt to give it a style, haphazardly draping realistic textures and lighting effects all over the place like an unmade bed made any additional benefits kinda pointless. I didn't understand why it ended up like this, but any criticisms were met with hostile responses of nitpicker from fans and it's like, oh, geez, I guess this is it now, huh? It certainly worked for showing the series was popular, sold like nobody business and still does, but it got me worried for what would come next. Like, if the audience doesn't care to see things improve, why should the people in charge? Ah, but then? Things got interesting. Spyro, the other original PlayStation franchise, now also owned by Activision, had its own remakes announced quickly after Insane's success, and from the first trailer, things were looking good. If its developers, Toys for Bob, weren't aware of Insane's criticisms, their games certainly reflected them. Or maybe they were only, you know, making choices we'd expected to begin with. Producing well-executed visuals and crunchy controls. I had gripes with it that overall had me still preferring the originals, but these mostly came down to the restrictions they were developed under. These were, after all, much bigger games than the Crash Trilogy, and they'd gone all out in completely redesigning them within a bold, cool new style that gave the package its own unique identity. Then CTR Nitro Fueled came on the scene, and even while using assets from the Insane Trilogy, retooled the entire experience, involving quality of life changes, a more polished presentation, with some kind of actual art direction no less, and an almost offensively funny amount of additional content paying homage to the franchise's entire history, showing that yes, we're allowed to remember what happened. I cannot stress how far its developers, Beanox, bent over backwards to please everyone, right down to when fans complained about their Rillaroo model, making Photoshop edits only for Beanox to change it themselves. The absolute balls. I like it just as much now as I did then, even if I uh, suck and will never get entropy. So imagine my absolute pleasure at discovering that both Toys for Bob and Beanox would be hired to tackle a new Crash title, while Vivi found what looks like better suited success on other projects. It's all good. Hell, even the commercials have been at a gold standard since they returned. We're having a bandicoot. Yeah, he's putting it together, folks. I should go. I made videos on the subject originally because I felt there was a weird imbalance of power, that we weren't getting the best results despite the fact we knew it was possible. I'm not uh, entirely naive, okay? I know I'm only some rando on the internet. I know I don't have any official authority on the subject, and yes, I would put things differently if I were to make my old videos about this over again. But I felt like I had a perspective on the subject shared by people who wouldn't have made those decisions, and thought, well, at least people can tell me if they agree or not. 
But things have changed. Every bit of forward momentum has shown me everything I hoped would happen. Made by professionals working on a level of quality I would expect, and even more exciting, wanting to do better. Now, I don't believe I had anything to do with this, but I do believe that there is a change in attitude. That these developers recognised what I recognised, the many issues that could be improved on, listening to the collective advice they think is worthwhile, and wanting to evolve from project to project even if other people scream about not letting anything change. After so many years of feeling like things were being mishandled or squandered, it now seems like the foot is heavy on the accelerator, and that somebody is willing to make crash- Go! Question is, does Crash 4 feel like the end result of all that progress? And now, the final blow! <laughs> <laughs> Taking place after the events of Crash 3, the evil doctors Neocortex and Nefarious Tropy are stuck in the distant past, trying to find a way home. Uka Uka does a big fart and rips open a hole in time and space, and they decide, naturally, to give it a sniff. This gives Aku Aku the jibblies, and he tells Crash, Oi, let's get cracking, and then the game starts and it's good, whatever, let's talk about it. We're doing exactly what we started out with in the 90s, stuck on a linear path, moving forwards to smash, spin, slide, and dodge your way to the exit. For older fans, there's a a slight difference to how Crash feels to play in the micro, with a permanent double jump and somewhat floatier reflexes, as well as the addition of a couple moves not found in the classic trilogy. But any doubts about these disappear very quickly. The challenge is scaled to these changes, and the way they're tailored to the level design creates a fit reminiscent of how those original games felt, even if some of it is a tight squeeze. While there are some alternative approaches on offer, it's laser focused on those mechanics, having to relearn the basics plus a whole new bunch of combinations not yet burned into our muscle memory. The major new gimmick is the power granted by Arku's buddies, the Quantum Masks, which allow you to phase bits of a level in and out, slow down time, change your direction of gravity, and produce a turbo spin. Past additional gimmicks have often felt too tangential to the core experience. Even Warped was guilty of this in its efforts to explore ideas for future Naughty Dog titles. But the beauty of the Quantum Masks is that they only appear within controlled sections to build on Crash's existing skill set, creating intense variations on classic problems. I'm not sure why he wears them as suits rather than on his face, but it does give me an idea. Uh, let's try a thing over here. Oh, B, you've outdone yourself this time. Same can be said of the throwback gimmicks. Side-on sections, vehicle sections, chase sections, adding to your momentum rather than feeling like they work under new rules. With modern systems comes modern options, and Crash is veritably stuffed with them. He's got a cursor underneath him for more accurate jumps that you can now turn on and off, you can remap the controls, and you can switch between two styles, modern and retro. Retro. Retro is the original trilogy setup, working on a life system, while modern gives you infinite chances to continue so you can body your way to the finish line. All excellent ways to ensure everyone gets the level of challenge best suited to them without erasing the need for a challenge at all. There's still an incentive not to die, mostly because you get rewards and bonuses for not doing so, but also because there's a new death counter added to show just how much pain you've taken on. And unless you're like, from Krypton, you'll take on a lot. And even then, Crash 4 is hard, okay? Genuinely, tooth-grindingly hard at times. And while that's easy for me to say as someone who isn't very good, it's a level of stress I've seen everyone grappling with. I don't think it's controversial to say that it's probably the hardest of the entire series. Certainly manageable, but new people might find the game pretty intimidating. Especially, especially as it ramps up towards the end. <laughs> the options on offer make it slightly less painful to push through if you're only looking to complete the main story. But if you're going for 106% if you're going for all of that on classic mode, you are you, <laughs> you're gonna have a hot time in the old town tonight. That said, I'm still playing, which is like tick box number one. The game's as addictive as it was 20 years ago. The first game I've ever beaten the day of purchase. Damn, you don't want to be me. It's very likely you'll want to pace yourself because there's a lot to be addicted to. Challenge upon challenge with a staggering amount of extra content. Time trials return, now with spooky ghosts you can follow and beat to give you an idea of how to do it right. As with the trilogy, you still get gems for breaking all of the boxes, but now there's a Rayman Origins thing whereby the amount of Wumper you collect can also win you gems, on top of discovering hidden ones in the levels. Some, like the originals, in secret cryptic ways that you'll have to figure out as you go. 
mode. Then there's the ones you get once you unlock Inverted Mode, a series of trippy level filters that range from purely aesthetic to actively affecting the physics of how you play. Perhaps the best of all of these are the flashback tapes, contextualised as recordings from Cortex's original training sessions before Crash 1, with the newly evolved Crash and Coco before putting them into the Cortex Vortex. These super tough crate challenges are an amazing new offering, incredibly satisfying to complete if you've got the chops to make the cut. But the thing that makes the difficulty so enticing, what makes for such an astute breakdown of what it's learned from the past, is that they've recaptured the rhythm of those first three games. The thing about Wrath of Cortex is that sure, superficially it's the same mechanics, but the rhythm of the gameplay is off. In spite of their best efforts and the inherent benefits of what they're copying, it feels stiff to manoeuvre. There's a lot of broken pacing, many of the sections feel bland and lifeless, pressing crash forward through a level isn't fun in and of itself, and it's no wonder the format was set aside for the next few outings. This is what led to the metaphorical sticky tape solution in the Titans games, which artificially padded the way you'd progress with overextended combat sequences, swamping you with enemies that fell only to the right level of time wasting. I did- wow, I did not have fun going back to Titans. Here, there's none of that. You're constantly on the go, the aim being to cut a continuous path through the levels you can eventually pump out like a heartbeat, and it seems like they're super aware of making that sensation a thing. There's emphasis on musical accompaniment with the actions you take thanks to a semi-dynamic soundtrack. That means, when you're doing it right, the rest of the level is singing along with you, making beats to your moves, and the fact I never really thought about how that could be possible within Crash again speaks to Four's power. Engine's Rocket Head boss is just so, so good because of this. One of my favourites in the series. Taking the rhythm of the gameplay as well as another old Activision brand and mashing them together into a one of a kind encounter. Sonic could take a lot of lessons from this whole rhythm thing when he's out of his latest blackout. There's a little bit of Sonic DNA in here, actually, thanks to the addition of new playable pals offering different perspectives. Coco is playable on all of Crash's levels, basically a skin swap and a very welcome one, but they're also joined by Cortex, Dingo Dial, and an alternate version of Torna, which is, you know, one of those things I never expected, but was absolutely worth doing. Cortex has intricacies that make his sections more puzzleish, requiring you to partially build a path forwards, but it's really Torna and Dingo where you get to cut loose, smacking mooks about and causing abject chaos. Come here. <laughs> they both have, like Reignited, a great kick to their controls and bomb their way through sections in a hella cathartic manner, Dingo sucking up everything in sight and Torna grappling from pillar to pillar, Nina Cortex style. They're also only mandatory to play in the main story twice, with a bunch of extra levels unlocked as you go, another way of offering the player choices if they're into them, and yeah, I was into them. I would love to play as them more in the future. Future, especially if Dingo Dial's gonna keep bringing the filth. Ah, bastards! 12 plus, welcome to the gang, son. But that's kinda cool, right? I didn't think in 20 years I would ever say the words, I want to play more of Torna and Dingo Dial. One of the things Crash fans have been craving is the opportunity for the franchise to surprise them, open them to ideas they'd never thought about, and I think 4 has a very healthy viewpoint on this. Dingo Dial being a good guy, again, not a decision I would ever make, but I think everyone can get on board with what they've done and how, yeah, of all the mutants, he really is one of those fellas you identify most with the series. You wouldn't see that guy anywhere else. Likewise, how they shook up Torna, albeit as an alternate dimensional version of herself, was a great decision too. A way to reclaim that character from her disappearance out of, the way I've heard it told, embarrassment, but without erasing the character that came before, very diplomatic way to do this. The gag of her existence holds up, she's still a hyper-realistic counterpart to the insane rat she hangs out with, it's just taken a different angle, and her design is, oh, ping. Wait, does that does that not just mean really good? Oh, for God's sake, I only heard it used for food. Don't guess it, bro. The overall aesthetic is gorgeous. From the start, I'm messing with props and enjoying the detail they've put in to make the world feel alive and kicking. And that's a natural extension of what Naughty Dog was doing, something other sequels did attempt but never quite made work without the know-how to stage it. Toys for Bob proved themselves as kings of staging with Spyro, their redesign choices adding to the worlds we loved rather than subtracting. And the same is doubly true of what they've done with Crash's world, which has so much humour and history behind it that I could babble on about the subject forever, but I uh, don't want any of you to die. I 
I can't think of a level environment I didn't enjoy or think was well suited to the Crash style. And as a huge fan of Princess and the Frog, it's like they knew I was coming. Just throw in a glam rock level next time, why don't you? They won't do that. It's just jokes. It's just jokes. <laughs> Unless. The big success, though, in my view, is the character design, and I feel like the stars have aligned to give us some great takes on the cast. I said at the time of the Reignited review that I loved Nicholas Cole's work. I thought he was a great choice for that series, given his understanding of shape language and storytelling detail. But he's not alone. Purchasing the Spyro art book reveals the discussions had and the talents put to use by the entire team of artists involved. Nicola Saviori, Devin K.D. Lee, Oleg Yerkov, Rob Duenis, Ryan Jones, Jacob Irick, so many talented artists with so many great ideas, and it feels incredibly validating to see their basic thought process was all stuff I said the Insane Trilogy was desperately in need of. So it's doubly validating to have them assigned to this job. They've done amazing work. The concept artists, the modelers, animators, everyone in the pipeline. This immense team of creators has put their blood, sweat, and tears into a look that, with its tighter focus, does what I've always advocated for. Previously, models were built and then left at the mercy of the lighting system, which means they only look good when in the optimum position to be affected by those lights, prone to looking unpredictably awful everywhere else. The new models do what the originals did. They rely on looking good before they even hit the engine, employing subtle effects and how they're built and coloured that mimic lighting and textures in a stylized manner. It means they can look good under a variety of automatic lighting effects, popping off the backgrounds to grab your phone. Folks have been comparing the models out of engine, and uh, <laughs> I think it speaks volumes. The main cast has been intelligently redesigned, made appealing and above all, easy to read. Cole has been vocal about going back not just to the original drawings by Charles M. Billas and his influences, but also the many different takes over the years, along with some modern ingenuity and this helps a lot in letting the game find ways to push on. Concept art shows more faithful takes on the characters, but it's clear this was simply a starting point, because while it's nice to show they can do it, it doesn't really prove we can move forward with those characters in new and exciting ways. For me, what they really nail with this version of Crash is his attitude, a cheeky dumb idiot who only just about knows what he's doing, but who's far from unlikable. I've said before that the Insane model doesn't really do it for me. You can see that they're technically correct in their recreation, but there's nothing going on with him. It's lifeless. Then you compare the new model with it, and none of it is technically the same, but the underlying attitude is almost identical. Personality is king in how these characters are drawn, and it's why they're so much fun to look at even when they're standing still. Coco might just be the best she's ever looked, communicating her character clearly, taking on shapes that differentiate her from Crash without being overcomplicated. Cortex, whoa. Cortex is kind of special. A lot of people assumed from screenshots he was super tall, like in Titans, only for the lineup to reveal he was still a shorty. Now, I don't know that this is exactly what they were going for, but it's kind of brilliant. It means Cortex now has the capacity to, up close or on his own, seem like a big, tall, evil schemer for his more dramatic moments, only to be easily tripped up when we realize he's just a little man. Mwati! Nobody will get this, I'm sorry. In some cases, they've also adjusted characters I don't think have ever worked. Tropy is a fun design in theory, but in practice, he's got a little too much going on. And if you build that as it is realistically, it looks a mess. What Cole's done is calmed the overall silhouette down into more manageable shapes, and given his armor some clear structural definition, you can now see how this guy could be put together, with the focus on expressing his personality, the big pompous ass that he is. I have to say, this is Tropy at his best, and an example of the great ways the game takes the Crash story forward, too. It was never truly verbalized in Warped, but it was obvious that Tropy was never caught Cortex's pal, someone Uka Uka found with his own agenda. Twinsanity was the first game to make something of that, got a lot of fans wanting more of that dynamic. I remember we used to hang out on forums and talk about the potential of a game where Tropy comes back and really does something with time and space for a change. Twenty years later, we're finally there, and when it turns out he's gone and found another version of himself, well, that's where it gets really funny. It's one of those ideas that shows up and is done with pretty quick, but it suggests so much, offers up a fun new status quo, and puts the idea in your head of the scope of this franchise. And other things that I don't want to talk about. I was so into the story they wanted to tell, and how they wanted to tell it. Mandy Beninav is clearly a fan, and more importantly, great at dialogue that says a lot with very little. No, <laughs> no Uka Uka with a villainy shareholder meeting today, alright? Relationships between the characters get a lot more playtime, which is performed well to boot. The nuances already 
variety present encouraged the voice actors to play it straight rather than overwork the jokes. And it's fun. I snorted multiple times. It's not just that the dialogue has me giggling, if that's what I was doing, it's been so long. The animation is real funny. No Crash game moves like this one. They chose not to do that thing everyone does now, with the characters constantly swinging around, and instead go for a huge variation of qualities that hits the Looney Tunes vibe right, even putting me in mind of the abruptness of the PS1 days. You're gonna want to do some freeze frames here, folks. Look at the pixies! The detailing makes for a package in tune with Crash as a brand, something I feel like we're sometimes shy of in other Crash titles. Like, uh, the music in Wrath of Cortex. It's fun, but it's an assault. <laughs> Someone <laughs> someone throwing band instruments at the audience, a bit too real, this actually happened to me. Walter Mayer's soundtrack on the other hand is more appropriate, complementing the gameplay and sounding true to the spirit of Josh Mansell's works, which are paid tribute to often. Not gonna lie, there's a couple bops in this one. <laughs> One thing I particularly liked was the integration of different character themes and sounds depending on what's going on, so areas will get different remixes based on who you're playing as, or the sections you've entered. So you can hear the umpa grunting of Dingodile's big ol' belly making its way downstream, what, <laughs> what the fuck? There was one word I found myself writing a couple times in my notes, and it was <laughs> inspired. And I do feel like it sums up its use of the history. Obviously there's a huge amount of references to things from the original trilogy, even subtle integrations that justify the canon of the spin-offs, though equally impressive are the callbacks and the level construction as much as the aesthetics. You might find some challenges strikingly familiar to the stuff you've been through in the past, as if you're visiting alternate dimension versions of them with different skills so many years later. However, it's not half as interesting as the way so many of the other sequels have been integrated into the makeup of the game, influencing the shape Crash 4 has taken. Four masks which offer unique powers, a multi-dimensional adventure with alternate versions of the characters, a big fat dingo dial going solo, Cortex getting his mojo back, a little rolling ball, a feud between the doctors, a lab in the iceberg, a city above the clouds. Falling. I haven't even touched the numerous cameos dotted around the place. I liked these secret imprints of the elemental masks in a level reminiscent of Wrath's pitch video, and each is found in a section that best represents their element. It's pretty darn clever. Everything is relevant, and and no good idea is totally left behind. In many ways, the game is enhanced by any knowledge of the wider series for those looking closer, means that the history still matters, but it's not compulsory to enjoy yourself, and that's great. Everybody wins. Suggest further mashups down the line, or whatever else they want to do, or I'll take 10. The broader point is that these aren't arbitrary choices. As I hoped it might, it takes those ideas from the classics or the sequels and refines them into something purposeful, keen to show us what it's learned from the past, but what puts their answer from a B to an A is how it builds on that with the confidence of its own ideas, showing how the gameplay and brand can evolve, while crucially not compromising on the unique identity of its developer. It's a crash sequel, but it's definitely Toys for Bob's baby and I have the DNA test here to prove it. Even outside those callbacks, it's obvious this team has the voice down and can take it further into new territories. I'm thrilled about the excitement the team has for the world it's taken on, how they've embraced it. It's rare to find folks working on a legacy brand who recognise not just the importance of the gameplay, but also how to frame that gameplay, granting it the appropriate voice and tone and finding the fun through the guidelines. An art just as important in the life of a brand like this, in spite of those who will tell you to stop nitpicking, bruh. Yeah, we'd all love Crash for the exact same if it was a bunch of wireframes and the levels were floating in a void. That'll show those artists, yeah, only nitpicker losers would have a meeting debating the inclusion of minute intricacies they think might add to our experience. Bunch of squares, babe, get on the bike. Nah, friendo. This is living proof of why details matter, why you love it when they get it right, and why people with this kind of talent deserve recognition for taking an opportunity and giving a damn. Don't know what straw man I'm supposed to be talking to anymore, but mark my words, Crash 4 is a fine, sick-ass, nasty boom-bang, don't run time and it's safe!
Okay, pretty okay. Okay, you get it. The, the game got me out of bed. I don't really know how to segue into the next part, so I'm just gonna say we're gonna talk about the stuff that might otherwise put me back in the bed and send me to sleep. Yeah, okay, that'll do. Right, yeah. Uh, there's a couple ideas here I'm not sure work as well as others, but it's not an extensive list. I'm more pleased about this than you are. This isn't the same as my outright frustration with the Insane Trilogy falling short of everything it could have done. Four is proof of this team's caliber, and I have a lot of trust in where they can take this in the future, should they be given the opportunity. But we're focusing on this game, and it's got a couple things going on I'm not sure work so good. I feel more constructive about it, though. There's things to say about improving on what's already present, over saying let's scrap the lot and start again, but uh, you didn't come here to have me stretch the point any longer, so let's go! As mentioned, Crash 4 is hard. Maybe too hard. A debate has opened up around its difficulty, with the stance either that it's the hardcore crash game folks were waiting for, or that it's too difficult to fully enjoy. And both are coming from people of wildly differing skill sets. I firmly believe the answer lies somewhere in the middle, because from my experience, it isn't the difficulty that's the issue, it's that the content around the difficulty is so stacked. The base is solid. While it's no cakewalk, and not everyone is going to want to complete it to the last percent, you can get a rather chewy run-through of the main storyline that allows enough breathing room to improve on your skills and finish however suits you best. Everything I said before about the control setup and rhythm helped me get into a comfortable flow. I enjoyed myself even more on a few revisits with a better grasp of the controls and stage layouts, really got where this game was coming from instead of feeling like it was unfairly hard. I love that it's so replayable. There's a great satisfaction to going at your own pace to explore explore and figure out what needs to be done, and yeah, I think the main experience is a justified size that you may or may not get the itch to invest in further. The problem is when you do sit down to commit to completion, even for a single level, there's a lot to make that experience fatiguing no matter the time you set aside. Levels run around 5 plus minutes, and this is if you don't die or repeatedly push yourself for these extra challenges, or get confused while looking for hidden boxes and gems in these densely packed locations, both visually and in terms of collectibles, or invest in the three modes of completion for each stage, which for certain rewards require clean runs through a level from start to finish, and if you screw up and need to restart, you'll be met with some seriously long loading times. Uh, spoiler, all of this will happen trust me. It's not horrible or anything, it's simply that, because of all the extra fat, taking time to play one level to 100% can feel like playing three levels at once, which makes the difficulty feel overdrawn. I mean, if I'm gonna get everything on a stage, I'll want to do it whenever I'm intimately familiar with the level in front of me after having a couple of runs at it, rather than putting it off for more than a couple sessions, and there's no way I'd be able to do that here without multiple protracted playthroughs of a stage from start to end. Something is going to outstay its welcome for someone. Even with much harder games, that's never usually felt like a problem, knowing how to scale the intensity of the challenge to a reasonable length of time, making my concern in this case that it gets less people to 106% than might otherwise go so far. In fact, somebody made a real good point on my Discord about how this can be at odds with the original's ethos. Those games often get called super difficult these days, especially the first one, but 2 and 3 generally had shorter levels with a casual appeal that, even at 100% completion, felt firm but fun. The jokes from journalists about Ensane being like Dark Souls, well, I put a lot of that down to using another game's name to boost search results traffic. But if they really cared, they'd use it here, because damn baby, this is Dark Souls. Many of the bonus challenges and other sections are forcing players to pull off moves that would most often be reserved for the pros, with very few breaks between big chunks of difficult, differing sections. One tweet absolutely nailed it when they said playing Crash 4 casually is fun, playing it for 100% is not. Then again, it's not entirely black and white. I enjoyed myself around this and liked having a few longer levels and meatier challenges. There are benefits as much as drawbacks to what they're trying to do. So, the complaint is less me saying, it's bad, don't do it, and more, okay, how do we reconcile this? Would a greater variation in level lengths be worthwhile? Maybe the chase section should have been their own stages? Perhaps be slightly less obtuse with certain hazards or hidden collectibles, especially the crates? I, I have to restart if I miss one, okay? I've heard most people complain about the flame crates, so I think those are worth putting in the bin. They slow things down and, personally, didn't offer enough differentiation on the TNT crates other than waiting. Inverted mode, I'm not the first to say this doesn't work. If anything, I think it needs to be a quick run mode like the time trials if it is going to show up again, and maybe that's the idea. It didn't feel like anything more than a graphical experiment disguised as a mirror mode. They achieve this better with the flashback tapes, which are totally upfront with what they're offering, and, once you get your head around them, are also manageable time investments. Maybe some of the actual game structure could have been divided up differently to aid some of this. I mean, definitely don't make us 
just do what you did with the additional character levels, where you play as them only to be forced to continue the crash levels they intersect with, what a colossal waste of time. I get the appeal of doing the Crash 1 map again, and the way they've updated it is nice, as if progressing through a pop-up storybook, but I also still see the appeal of warp rooms. There's an expectation there of how long you might spend per section, playing levels in whatever order you want before a boss. I'd even reorder or space those sections out differently to help the game's third act flow a little easier. I love the multiple twists, but I also feel they're incorporated in a way that makes the meat of the game feel shorter than it actually is. You go through two fake outs, accepting maybe one of them is going to lead to more, then when you think you have a cooldown section to play as all the characters one last time, it turns out to be super challenging, followed by the game's final levels, by which point you're kind of exhausted. I'd rather the city section came after Cortex and then have the run up to what feels like the final boss be the penultimate section, with all the characters getting involved in the trophy fight. Then I'd go for that final section. I'm not sure this is a very definitive solution, I do like that the game's not predictably paced as a sprawling journey, but there was a moment where I thought I was doing the final run up only to find out it would happen twice more, and I might have been more prone to savouring those previous sections if they moved things around a bit. I'm not very good at mechanical talks, so I'm not going to get too deep into it, but a buddy of mine made this absolutely amazing mechanical breakdown of what he felt the game needed to improve on while also playing into its existing strengths, and I highly recommend you check it out for a more concrete idea of how a lot of this can be resolved. Crucial feedback. All this said, I think it's going to make 4 age very interestingly. It's already apparent that its difficulty is a great point of contention, and the developers are probably aware of this. I have no doubt future games will feel more reined in. That has the added effect of making 4 perhaps the only game in the series with this level of substantial challenge, one included, and I think that'll add to its appeal, there'll be no other Crash game like it. As something that acts as an end to the original series, it makes its challenge feel appropriate. It's already shifted the gears in conversation from Old Crash the Best or Old Crash is Hard to more active debates about the specifics of Crash's difficulty, and those discussions are very serious in a way they never were with the others. It's highly promising. A bold step forward should make a distinct mark with the audience, overstepping the original's boundaries rather than playing it safe, and I applaud it for taking the risk. At least now, we know where we stand. But B Mask, do we know where we stand with the graphics? <laughs> I, I have to apologise, the, <laughs> the segues are real clumsy today. While a fan of the style, there were a few aspects I felt were worth challenging. I think the crash they've come up with is great, his design is great, but some of the more prominent features are lost, which takes away from his lunatic qualities. When I think of Crash, I think of these big mad chompers like the mask or something, abrasive out there gnashes. Here they're filed down and super detailed, and I don't know, I give a lot of slack on talent, but this choice feels a little too, <laughs> a little too furry for the tone they're going for. You can always tell, damn it. I know there are people who don't want any more changes, but I don't think it would be out of the question to consider further alterations. Such moves towards that zany, hand-drawn look, and that's more about the technology available than the artists. They've done their best with the tools at their disposal, but sometimes the lighting can make the characters look more like plastic toys than living cartoons. It's a bigger conversation I've no doubt would be had as time goes on, maybe looking at some guiding examples, and then I push this copy of Hurdy Gurdy across the table and walk away. They're on the right path, a few tweaks to the shader effects and attempts to make the model deformations more seamless would be enough if they decide to stick with these assets for another title. This is, after all, what the original trilogy did, and I wouldn't want them to throw out what they can still use. The one design that threw me, however, was Embryo. It's not bad, it looks amazing in-game, but uh, I'm not really sure what we're going for. He's a counter to Cortex, also has a huge noggin, but in a different way, and here I feel like it's too evenly exaggerated, if that makes sense. Uh, I'm not sure where the emphasis is settled on. I love the overall twist of his inclusion in the level he's in, that he's using mutagen like magic to bring objects to life. That is so brilliant. A mutagen sorcerer. But I wouldn't say it's well communicated in his new design, if that's the case. That's not all on the art though, because I'm not exactly sure what he's doing in the story. Yeah, we're uh, getting into it now. See, uh, the big wrinkle for any Crash fan is that it's not clear why he's there. Ryo was the shy, stuttering genius who invented everything the more aggressive Cortex ended up taking credit for, until he'd finally had enough, which means the last time we saw him in the trilogy, he was working with Crash and Coco. So like, Bruh. Now, this hasn't been ignored. Not exactly. Sometimes I think you're my only friend. And then I realize 
No, that's right. Multiple hints exist that you can find scattered throughout the game that this is a hasty alliance. Calling Crash and Coco his friends, fighting the person who replaced him, that was good. But I felt a lot of it was a bit hand wavy. For something as deep rooted as this, I kinda wanted the reason for his involvement to be more upfront, have more of an effect, and not in an overwritten fanfic -y way. A super fast montage of Cortex plucking his allies from other dimensions or times, I'd be down with that. Something. It's kind of retroactively made Mind Over Mutant look even better at covering this, which seemed thin at the time, but now shows how to do it right, making a big deal out of his return in a way that was genuinely quite funny. I invented the Evolvo Ray and mutagenetic techniques still used by that treacherous Cortex today. I was in the first game! <laughs> doesn't help that his boss is just a repeat of the Crash 1 experience, which, I don't know, if there hadn't just been a remaster, I might have found at least nostalgic. If you're gonna do Brio, you need to have him become something new, and they do, just not in the boss fight. Maybe he could have showed up again, little mini boss fights at the end of some of the other worlds in different forms, like, do I want to fight Louise? Who? Or, here's an idea, turn Brio into- Fish people. Dang it, you were so close to making 13 year old me happy. <laughs> Jesus, I wrote three paragraphs on Embry. Oh, that's not a good idea. It's not that I think everything has to be sorted out to fit within the glorious canon of Crash, but there's an opportunity here to, in a game purportedly fixing those issues, use every part of the buffalo. Expand on those details. The game does do this, and when it does, it's amazing, but unfortunately this is one of the main things I felt super conflicted about. This game has some of the best storytelling, and some of the most spotty. Sometimes it's a bit anemic, like we're missing a couple, not even pages, sentences that would otherwise make make things feel more complete. Characters will literally just drop in and out of the story, and while most everyone does get their moment, they might be missing their beginning, their middle, or their end. I love Lani Loli, but I can't help but feel he should have just outright replaced Arku, have Arku go missing as they search for him with this new guy, watch his arc go from panicking shy guy to the mask that saves his buddies. Well, so who was this? Who, who is that? Who, who, who is it? Are we saving that? Mm. Occasionally, it'll lean out of the character dynamics into lol random jokes, which comes across as a little insecure. I only say this because this is a great story and the writing is so good. Far from untalented. I just felt let down by some of the choices I'd seen before. You know the one. Please consult your doctor before participating in anything that actually isn't what it says it is. Even though I said something else, I'm actually saying something else entirely. Phyllis, what are you doing? Get out of my house. I need you out now. I think they're capable of better. And I know so. It's in the game. The events of this game are absolutely 100% canonical, unless you didn't like them, in that case it was all a dream. I get it, Crash is all about the funny, but it's a different kind of funny, one this game already serves well outside of the obvious verbal gags. Generally, I would want to see the story trust itself a little more, and not be afraid of what's already there, which is, well, despite definitely being a worse game, why to insanity still has my heart. <laughs> Call it a hot take, I guess. Here's my deal with that game, and this is for all the people who feel like they have to leap in every time it gets brought up to say, you can't like that, it's a big glitchy mess, or you did it buddy, all feelings removed, got him. I remember life before Twin Sanity. Crash had cool games, but I didn't really think beyond that. I didn't really think of it being narratively scalable outside of here's Crash in another wacky world, then a bunch of fans got to develop their own Crash game. And while they didn't quite hit the mark, their extensive plans did get our attention. In spite of 4's obvious superiority, like, of course, and while Crash 2 will always be my gold standard, Twin Sanity is one of my personal favourites, because the potential has yet to be matched. I've ruined the lives of so many, I can't be expected to remember them all. It used every character, pulled on every bit of history, and then it added a bunch of new stuff or twists on old ideas that fit so nicely into its world that uh, they haven't left us yet. Even the unused ideas, the crazy amount of concept art of what the team really wanted to achieve, they were all decisions from an official source that made me go, yes, my god, why has nobody done this? Any contact with our alter egos in this reality could prove disastrous. Welcome to the 10th- <laughs> Forget I said anything. I remember how fans reacted to that at the time, and I think it speaks to why that game is given so much lip service, simply for the potential it inspired. We've talked about how Ford does get it, making the most of the Crash universe when it gets the chance, but it doesn't go as far, and falls short of being the big, larger-than-life celebration of the franchise coming back I anticipated. One example is that only the Doctors show up as villains this time. I get the sense this was deliberate, that they've abandoned their mutant henchmen to get the job done right, but that's 
me inferring rather than what's actually on screen, and I think it would have been possible to make more of that, even as a joke. Personally, I would have gone with a couple of the old mutant henchmen rather than them. It would be fun to see how different dimensions affected them or gave them new powers. It is odd not to see them outside of cameos. Tiny was a huge staple of Cortex's gang, and it's almost eerie not having him around. I know originally he was a Brio boy, and maybe they got bigger plans, I don't know. However, it's also not a fair comparison, and I don't believe the developers should be expected to match it. Unlike Twin Sanity, 4 knows its limits and works within them, making strong decisions for a tight framework so that you can get the most solid version of what it offers, rather than hypotheticals. Choices like getting to play as Torna and Dingo Dial, fighting all the Doctors, bringing in the Jet Board and Polar, they seem like selected targets that represent a cross-section of the original trilogy, and getting those to feel like enough as they are. It got me thinking about the idea of what a Crash Force should include, what that game should be. Something Wrath of Cortex doesn't really make an attempt to grapple with, something a lot of Crash sequels just haven't tried. I bring Twin Sanity up only because I think it highlights the few blind spots I'd like to make seen. A wildly creative game, still incredibly unique in its goals even with the existence of 4. Uh, don't take this as me saying I think Twin Sanity's framing is entirely well executed, it's not. Or that anything I said earlier on what I like about 4 isn't true, because it is. All it meant was that it didn't match the full scope I'd been anticipating, which is my fault. Probably going to be fixed by sequels. I hope this doesn't sound too unreasonable, I, I just didn't want to pretend these things didn't cross my mind. It would have been nice for this to be the mega standalone game, and had those considerations been made, it would have become my new top favourite. It was, uh, genuinely that close. There is, however, one aspect that brilliantly sticks the landing. Tell me, Crash, is this all there is? Forever? Huh? This isn't a full-blown crisis on the level of what happened into Insanity, which is excellently structured to create true cartoon chaos, but it does tap into something interesting. Cortex was about done when 3 began, dragged into being evil again, so his revenge is more of a byproduct of his return. He gives in, Tropy takes charge, and Cortex ends up joining the good guys, only to realise they don't really accept him either. Our bad guys had a change of heart too. Bad guy? I don't know that Cortex is unself-aware enough for this to totally make sense, it always seems like he enjoys being evil and knows it, but it does suggest that he doesn't have an endgame, so he decides to change the rules. Bye bye, bandicoots! <laughs> and now for me to stop... me! I had a ridiculous grin on my face when they pulled back the curtain here. Cortex's final plan? To go back in time and stop himself from creating Crash Bandicoot. Means we get to bring things full circle at Cortex Castle in 1996. It's a fantastic move. Crash 1's the hardest of the trilogy, making the final level take us back to a point where it feels appropriate both plot-wise and mechanically, even if I refuse to accept these portraits are anything but fakes. Designed to cover up his actual circus clown past, even the mobile games backing me up here, would have liked the original Cortex model to represent his past self too, but I get it, uh, make the models you can in the time you got, right? They gave us the old projector to make up for it, that's a nice touch. Listening to Cortex desperately pleading with himself to stop, it's funny and tragic to see unfold. There's no turning back, <laughs> Crash is inevitable. What a neat way to make his final encounter matter. You get to do a big new twist with the trophy betrayal, but also do it again with the series main villain, letting him end the game without feeling like you've seen it all before. Something Charlie pointed out to me about the final boss soundtrack, which is cool, is that you can hear the ebb and flow between Crash and Cortex's themes as they duke it out. Assistance, help! Speaks to what the ending's doing more than anything else. Warped didn't finish all that definitively. Although it certainly has a complete ending, there's still an expectation set that Crash as a series will just keep going and going, so it was never that satisfying in bringing things to a close. 4 actually addresses that and creates what feels like a solid bookend to Crash and Cortex's story so far, embodying the futility of their endless struggle. It doesn't get much more final than that. With this moment covered, the loops closed on where we came in, but now opens the door to new possibilities, without feeling like we're leaving behind a bunch of unresolved tension. There's no longer an expectation of what Crash should or could be next. Questions are finally answered, including the biggest one of all. What might have happened had things been different? And that's, uh, it's more closure than I expected. Ah, he's at last. For now... <laughs>
Uka, Uka is free. No. If I had any worries, it would be how Summer Framed 4 and its more divisive elements as a failure. It's true that it hasn't done the numbers of the Insane remakes, and people are definitely split on whether or not they believe it's totally successful at what it's doing. I don't think this has been received that badly, especially given extenuating circumstances, but even with that in mind, I can't deny the response has felt lesser. I I'm always aware that there could be a repeat of what happened before, as the audience gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until you all scream for more remakes, God stop, and that would be a shame because things are very different. I wonder how many people got the challenge Jason was laying down in 2017, when he said those words of doing the games we've already made. He was saying, yeah, what you're making? We did that. We know it works. But what about when you don't have our help? I've criticised Naughty Dog's aggression towards Crash sequels in the past, but it's understandable. They've seen the effort to make more Crash games fail already, watching titles coasting on the brand's existing success that didn't quite have a firm understanding of what made Crash fun in the moment, only how it was fun in theory or as a cool selling point on the box. As Naughty Dog continued to innovate, they watched the conversation around Crash stagnate, all the same people saying all the same things. And Jason's question was if it was worth anyone dragging Crash out of the past for a new generation, if they could recreate the excitement around what Naughty Dog started. Was it possible? Could you do it? Could you make it feel like the old days? I think Crash will always have an audience, if we only go by those insane sales. But the fourth game isn't resting on that success. It's not exactly reinventing the wheel, and God knows it's got features not everyone will find attractive. But you'd have to be crazy to think this team's phoning it in. Toys for Bob and Beanox have produced a ridiculously substantial title, one that even with its issues is trying to grapple with the series and ask serious questions about how it functions, can continue to function, and comes back at it in full force even under pressure. Really, reignited was not that long ago for them. This is not a total regurgitation. It is a proper, well-studied sequel. In the way the classics stepped to each subsequent game, from 1 to 2 and 2 to 3, this is a wonderful bridge from Crash 3 to the modern day, built with its own creativity and technical skill, as well as using whatever materials it's needed from those 20 plus years in between. And now that step has been formally made, I think further iterations can only keep building on this. Not existing only as a passing remember this moment or as a cameo on Friends, Chandler must be loving this. He's the kind of guy who pretends to be normal, just hanging out on the couch making jokes. And then you mention you play Crash and he's like, oh, you too, huh? So what do you think of Inverted Mode? Personally, I thought it was kind of- I said before when talking about Spyro that a sequel, more than a remake, would be how we tell if they can really recreate its success. Obviously, playing levels I've played before is going to make me go, hey, it's like old times. But if you can make me feel that with a level I've never confronted before, in an abstracted sense, away from the originals, then you've nailed it. And guess what? They did. I was a kid again, cursing myself for screwing up, but still wanting to keep at it and get into the zone of a good run. Being shocked by stuff I didn't see coming, laughing with characters I hadn't been around for so long, and it truly felt like I was picking up where I'd left off so long ago. More than any of the other sequels I'd played trying to chase that elusive dragon. a uh, Bandicoot. uh both. I'm seeing debates pinning down new feelings people have about what it does right and wrong, people coming together to try and gauge what it's saying to them and where it might all be going, and that gives it a spark I haven't felt for a long ass time. That's it really. It's the feeling of encountering new challenges, new experiences, new discussions, that makes it feel like old times. After 22 years, he's finally done it. Crash Bandicoot finds himself at the top of Mount Sequel, having overcome all obstacles in his path to rescue the 3D platformer from certain death, and bring hope to the people below. He watches as the heavens open, and, from the parting clouds, the big man himself approaches, holding the answer we have sought since I did a bit in a video in 2016 and kind of need to make good on now. The Bandicoot takes it all in his stride, and looks at the deity square in the eyes as if to ask, Did I do it? Did it happen? Did we save video games? And lo, a voice responded, You never stopped saving them. Whoa. Thank you everyone for watching. I'm so glad to finally have this video out. It took a lot longer than expected, but here we are. We, we are here, and the video is here, and uh, thank you for being here.
A huge shout out to all of my patrons for their patience as I've been getting this together. Their funding has led to some really good videos this year and I hope that uh, more can happen in the future. So keep watching all the stuff that I do. I will put links to many things in the description and here, especially things I showed in the video. And we will all meet again after we have uh, gotten our way to 106% because that, that don't complete itself to get the band-aids. It's good to see you again.